All right, let's go. Okay, welcome everyone. We'll make a move. Um, and um, today we have the privilege of hearing Professor John Newnham speak to us about how we can as a country prevent preterm birth, although he just told us that West Australia will be their own country soon. Um, John needs no introduction. He's Senior Australian of the Year last year, this year, this year, sorry. And uh, he's like the rock star of obstetricians and he's more popular than Kmart uh, in Victoria last night but he denies that maybe he's more popular than Target. Um, so um, as usual, uh, we will mute you on entry to the, uh, um, the session. And if you have any questions, please um, type them onto the chat pane. This session is recorded and hopefully it works. And with John's permission, it will be uploaded onto our School of Women's and Children's website. Um, if you have a real burning question, just raise your hand with the hand icon and he will break off and uh, attend to you, I think. Right. So without further ado, over to you, John. Thank you. Well, well thank you very much, Julie. And thank you for the very kind invitation to give this presentation. And uh, William Tano I'm already sitting there, who I can see. Uh, you've heard me talk about this before. Um, but basically, I'm going to talk about our national program to prevent preterm birth and, and how it came about and what it is and where we think we're going in the future. And basically, this is the Australian Preterm Birth Prevention Alliance, which is the first national program uh, to, to strategically lower the rate of preterm birth across a country. It sits as a subcommittee of the Perinatal Society of Australia and New Zealand, which you'll see in the top left. You'll see the logo in the top left. So the Pazance, Perinatal Society of Australia New Zealand, has a variety of subcommittees, this and IMPACT, which deals with the randomised controlled trials that William is very involved in, uh, and the Stillbirth Alliance, which aims to lower the stillbirth rate across Australia. Uh, the program is called The Whole Nine Months. That's the, that's the trademarked program, the, the social media program largely, that underpins all of this, uh, and then uh, the various organisations we're affiliated with and are part of shown down the bottom, along with one of our major philanthropic contributors, which is uh, the Stan Parent Foundation. So I think everybody on this, uh, on this webinar would know, it knows all about preterm birth. So, so preterm birth is defined as birth before 37 weeks. Now that is a definition that we inherited from our ancestors. And it really came from work done, you know, heavily in the UK, Scotland, Aberdeen area, you know, 50, 60 years ago, which was seemed entirely reasonable at the time, uh, but really it's that 37 is too early. So 37 to 39 is now usually referred to as early term, but I think that the definition of 37 weeks has actually uh, unfortunately caused a little bit of harm over the years. The incidence of preterm birth varies in different regions of the world, of course, and in Australia, it's typically eight to 9% of all birth. But very importantly for us, in Indigenous Australians, the rate is almost double at 14 to 15%. And there are a lot of potential uh, uh, causes and reasons around that. And I'll return to that later. We have uh, in our state 34,000 births each year in the not yet nation of West Australia, uh, which gives us 3,000 preterm births. And so if you multiply West Australian data by 10, you get the nation. So our nation has nearly 340,000 births each year, and we have nearly 30,000 preterm births. So that's the, our national figures. I put this slide up, which was published in The Lancet in 2012, uh, showing preterm birth rates in various parts of the world. But what I really want to show is this sentence, which the editor of The Lancet made, made a fuss about, saying that the, the, the general community and even the medical profession doesn't really appreciate this and that's why I put it up and that is that preterm births the single greatest cause of death and disability in children up to five years of age in developed countries and is nudging the number one in developing countries now as well. So I think there's been a massive under under appreciation certainly in in, in the world of obstetrics uh, that we know preterm births very important as a daily issue in a hospital but the fact that it is the major cause, the single greatest cause of death in young children has really not been appreciated by us as obstetricians, uh, but by the general community, by our philanthropic organisations. Uh, and, and it's extraordinary. I, th I think the reason is 
that it's always been assumed or been assumed for a very long time that uh, really life begins at birth. Pediatrics begins at birth. And when I was a medical student, um, I was taught basically that the, the obstetrics is about delivering a baby, getting the passenger out of the passages, uh, and then medicine started after that. And uh, my whole working life has actually come from my fascination as a medical student that I, I thought that there was an undiscovered continent in there of the, of the life before birth. And I've had the great privilege of spending my life exploring it. So I think it's heavily a cultural thing. And parts of Asia, traditional parts of Asia do not hold that view. Uh, I understand in traditional Korean culture, you're uh, one on the day you're born. So Kim Jong-un may be ahead of us in our understanding, appreciation of life before birth. So he, he would have been one on the day he was born. And that, that's in various parts of traditional uh, North Asian culture. Okay, so you all know this. So the problems for the, the mother, for the newborn, for the children, for adults, just all of these sort of things. And, and and different people in the community would find, would have different emphasis on this. We do a lot of talking to philanthropic organizations, et cetera. And I'm, I'm fascinated as to which of all the things on this list, various people will find interesting. So for the mothers of, the mothers of, of babies that were born very preterm, the separation from the child is something they talk about a lot. And eventually they feel as though the child actually belongs to the hospital, not to them. And taking ownership of the child is something that can take quite a long time for them. Uh, in, in childhood, the obvious things are there, but it's all about now learning difficulties and behavioral problems at school age have, have, be, have really become uh, very, very prominent for us. And I've been doing a lot of work here in WA linking schools with medicine uh, and um, I'm doing my best. This issue is not just within the province of the Minister for Health, but also within the province of the Minister for Education. So uh, linking schools with what's happened in labor wards many years before is one of the things I've been working at and will work even harder at in the, in the future. There's also long-term risks of metabolic syndrome in, in the child uh, and then loss of employment and socialization issues. As you also probably know, there's a whole growing literature now, in particular out of North Europe, that for a woman who delivers preterm, her risk of death uh, in the years that follows is increased. And how much of that is causation, how much of that is association is yet to be teased out, which is not the topic of this, of this uh, conversation. So, so basically, we, we here in Western Australia have been working on ameliorating preterm birth and preterm birth in the sheep model and the human model for 30, 35 years. And I, um, as a, as a, I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist and I've spent my life delivering very preterm babies and handing them to my friends who are the neonatologists. And I, as the years went by, I started to apologize to women that we, we hadn't been able to prevent this. I, I had one moment in 2013, it was a Saturday night and it was a woman, 24 weeks, ruptured membranes, in labor, bleeding, transverse line, no amniotic fluid. And, and it, it took a very you know, big classical cesarean section to atraumatically deliver this baby. And I, I, I just felt sick, I, I felt terrible. And I remember walking down the corridor with our, with our, our fellow, our maternal fetal medicine fellow, and said that, that five weeks ago, she had her routine 19 week scan there's a whole lot of information that's just gathering ahead of steam on the predictive ability of cervix length and the efficacy of vaginal progesterone to prevent preterm birth. Uh, this, we could have had the opportunity to prevent this five weeks ago and we didn't. And we've got to do something about this. And that was probably the single moment when I decided that we've got to try to do something. Now, Western Australia is the ideal place to do this. You may not know Western Australia is the Western one third of Australia. The population is heavily concentrated in the south around the capital city of Perth. We've got a population of about 2.2 million people. Uh, and it's, we're, but we're separated. We're basically an island. We've got desert on one side, ocean on the other. Our borders actually now are closed because of COVID. But really, there's only one road into Western Australia, in and out. And um, 
So there's quite an island mortality, uh, island mentality, and yet all the medical services are all linked. So even though our referral base, to, we've only got one major perinatal centre, everything's concentrated in one place, the hospital I work in, and our referral base goes for 2,200 kilometres to the north and then to the south. So everything's flown in by the flying doctor service and all the protocols basically come out of this one major hospital. So everybody knows everybody, everything's very well computerized, the data linkages, linkage systems are all in place. And so the idea of doing a population-based study in Western Australia is very attractive. So in 2013 and then launched in 2014, we decided to put in place a whole of population, whole of state program based on whatever interventions we thought could work in our environment uh, and then to see what would happen. And this is the first publication from that effort. This was published in May 2017 in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology as the report of major impact, showing what happened after the first 12 months of introducing this whole of population program. So what did, what did we decide to do? Well, we went for the low hanging fruit. And uh, of course we did, uh, we actually didn't have any money. So we had some small philanthropic donations, but our healthcare system is very well endowed financially, but, uh, but prevention is the hardest thing to get funding for. To, to get funding for clinical services, not that difficult. To get funding for original research studies, a bit more difficult, but can still be done. But a pre pre preventative whole of population program is the hardest of all. Nevertheless, uh, this, we, the low hanging fruit we went for are these seven interventions. So the first one was no pregnancies to be ended until about 39 weeks gestation, unless there is an obstetric or medical justification. Now this was really tough. The, the literature as all pediatricians uh, listening to that, you know that there's a very strong literature showing that birth before 39 weeks is associated with problems in childhood. And in the US, there have been very big attempts made, especially down the west coast of the US, to, to effectively ban birth, planned birth before 39 weeks gestation. But delivering babies before 39 weeks, um, de delaying birth till 39 weeks means that some will go into spontaneous labor. And my colleagues in private practice and about 40% of our births are handled in the private sector, very nervous about this. And I wanted endorsement from our Australian Medical Association, which is basically the doctor's union, very politically active uh, in, in here in the West, Australia as a whole, but definitely in the West. I wanted their endorsement. And so I said, when I put this up to them for endorsement, they said, no, 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 it's got to be 38 weeks. And I said, no, 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 look at the, look, here's the literature, it's got to be 39 weeks. And so I settled, I weakened, I compromised at 38 and a half weeks. I, I took a lot of stick from this, in particular from from presenting this in the United States, that it should be 39 weeks. Anyway, the, the, the problem then went to our college in Melbourne uh, with a heat as to whether this should be 38, 38 and a half or 39 weeks. And, and it was getting quite uncomfortable, but basically peace has prevailed and peace was brought about by one word and the word is about. So about 39 weeks brought peace across our land. It's, it's a bit ridiculous, really, because the word about could mean anything you'd like. But basically what we're saying is that if you deliver a baby electively at 38 weeks and five days or six days, well, there's no probably no biological difference uh, and, and, and people shouldn't be hung out to dry for doing that. And in fact, if you reviewed my own clinical practice, you'd find it, you know, I, I, would, have, I would have transgressed on that many times myself. So anyway, that's the official phrase now through the college as well as through our preterm birth alliance, that the official phrase is about 39 weeks, but that does not mean 37. The next thing we did was introduce measurement of the length of the cervix at all mid-pregnancy scans. So in Australia, the standard time to get your mid-pregnancy routine scan is at 19 weeks gestation. That scan's variously called your mid-pregnancy scan or your anatomy scan or your morphology scan. And at that scan, um, we measure, you know, the femur length, the humerus length, look at the outflow tracks from the heart, et cetera. But the, but, but the only thing in mid-pregnancy scans for which there's level 
one evidence that it's effective is actually measuring the length of the cervix. So a long cervix is predictive of term birth and a short cervix is predictive of preterm birth. I'll return to the details of that soon. Then, then what are we gonna do about it if it's short? And that is prescribe natural vaginal progesterone. So we have a, a long story with progesterone in obstetrics and progesterone was originally discovered to be the hormone that maintains pregnancy in the mid part of the last century. And that's where it got its name from, progest, progesterone, maintaining pregnancy. Uh, and, and effectively, to cut a very, very long story short, progesterone doesn't work if you inject it intramuscularly, doesn't work if you take it orally. The pool of progesterone circulating the woman is so large that anything you administer won't make much difference. But it works if you apply it into the vagina. And we think it's working in the region of the cervix, not systemically. And the cutoff for a cervix length with progesterone is known to be, was well, believed to be 25 millimeters, which is what we all use religiously, is 25 millimeters is the cutoff. So a cervix length of 25 millimeters or length measured transvaginally with an empty bladder is the cutoff to get vaginal progesterone. And we put a lot of work in to make sure that any woman in Western Australia who had a short cervix would be, would be prescribed progesterone that day, not the day after, that day. So a lot of work went into setting up the connections between radiology practices and obstetric imaging services and local family doctors and local pharmacies to make sure even in our country regions that this is available. Uh, and in many parts, there was, it is heavily subsidized to encourage women to take it because if it's not subsidized, it's quite expensive. Natural vagina progesterone for this indication and for, the, for all its indications for preterm birth prevention was approved by the Australian FDA late last year and is, is under consideration for the PBS as I speak. Then once we pre prescribe progesterone, we then continue to watch the cervix to see if it shortens. And if it continues to shorten, and originally that was less than 10 millimetres, but for us now, it's, it's a clinical decision if it's continuing to shorten, and we will we'll measure it every week until 24 weeks, uh, we will then put a cyclage in. Vaginal progesterone also works for women with a prior history of spontaneous preterm birth. So that's any preterm birth spontaneous between 16 and 34 weeks gestation. There have been a couple of trials which cast some doubt on that, but those trials all began the progesterone very late. And to cut a long story short, what we now know is that vaginal progesterone, if prescribed late, that's after 22 weeks gestation, doesn't work. It doesn't work if you're already contracting. It doesn't treat preterm labor. You've got to start it earlier than that. But, and that, that differentiation was not clear in the literature and has caused a lot of confusion. Anyway, so there are our two indications for vaginal progesterone. A short cervix found on, on routine cervix length measurement and a prior history of spontaneous preterm birth. We also wanted to increase our smoking prevention strategy. So in, in Australia, the smoking rate in pregnancy has been falling for decades and now sits at about 11% of the population, which is way too high, but it's much better than it was. Um, but in Indigenous Australians, the smoking rate is 50%. And that has been a straight line for decades. The, the very, very effective tobacco control uh, programs that have been running through our health departments like Quit for Two and Quit Line and various other things like that, they have been effective, but they do not work on, on Aboriginal Australians. And that we now understand why. The reason is that the, our health promotion programs that are aimed, are aimed typically at us as individuals. Don't smoke, you might get lung cancer, you know, have your bowel occult blood tested so that you don't get bowel cancer, et cetera. But Aboriginal Australians respond to group messaging. You need to alter the behavior of the entire group, not just the individual. Uh, and so we now know why, they, why those strategies don't work. Now, now we're doing things to try to, to try to make them so they do work, which is actually much harder. And then the last thing is we started our own preterm birth prevention clinic, which was funded by our Minister for Health. Uh, and that was to, is to look after the most complicated cases. 
So that, that's a once a week clinic. It does look after the most complicated cases, but it, it, it's heavily involves around cervix length measurement. So we run cervix length measurement as part of the clinical service. So that is the, um, they, they are the seven strategies we introduced. We had a big public health campaign that went with it and uh, we did it on, with, without a lot of money initially. And we did this through, through collaboration with our major newspaper called the West Australian, surprise, surprise. And, and basically these are, these are calls for action. So these are the various things that appeared and appear today, which, which basically is a call to action to send women to our website. So the whole nine months.com.au or now Preterm Birth Prevention Alliance, these various websites, they all hook in, in together and basically mean that women can look on their telephone and get the latest information that they need. We also ran very active social media and um, uh, we have a per person employed basically doing this. So we make sure that pretty much every day something is up on social media, Facebook, um, et cetera, to make sure that the, 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 the latest information is being got out there and to keep people very aware. We also produce these magazines, uh, which come out through our newspaper. And basically, in the absence of having much money, we, these magazines are mainly for advertising things like outdoor furniture and you know, various things like that. And you, they, you can sell the advertising within it. So we produce these basically at no cost by selling the advertising to IVF companies and vitamin companies, et cetera, so that we can produce these. These were always just West Australian until this year, and, and we're now going national. So this, the magazine this year has uh, uh, stories relevant from Eastern Australia as well. And next year, we'll make it a purely national magazine. So they, you'll find those throughout waiting rooms uh, all, all over our state. So that's how we did it. So that was the whole nine months uh, and then we did a very, very active outreach program. So to start this, I took a little team of myself, a young woman who's an obstetrician, our chief ultrasonographer, and one of our specialty midwives. And we traveled all over the, all over the state speaking in all the local hospitals to make sure that everybody understood exactly what it was when we, when we launched the program, which we launched in May, 2014. Um, and so what happened? So we launched it in May 2014 with, with, with everything we could throw at it to make sure that we weren't just educating the healthcare practitioners, we weren't just educating the radiologists and, and sonographers on how to measure the length of the cervix properly, but we made sure that we could get to the entire pregnant population and their families if we possibly could. So we planned to, to analyze it after the first year to see what had happened, uh, and this is what happened. Now, th this is a run chart and this is, this is implementation research. So this is what happens after you've done randomized controlled trials, you do implementation research. And what, it, what a run chart shows is of the time on the horizontal axis, which is divided into epochs, typically two or four month epochs of time. On the vertical axis is the, is the subject of interest, which in this case is singleton preterm birth. This talks only about singletons. And then the dotted line in the middle is the median of the preceding years. The, the intervention you can see was started in 2014, 2015, and then it shows what happened after the intervention. And you, you, statistical significance is conferred by having six epochs above or consecutively above or below the line. In this case, below the line, because you're preventing preterm birth. So we introduced this in, in May 2014, effectively, though we'd been talking about it unofficially a little bit before that. And, and we lowered the preterm birth rate by 7.6%, and that was statistically significant. So that was uh, very reassuring to see, but to dissect it out, we look at the different times. So if you look at the bottom left, this is the 32 to 36 week age group. And as you would expect, the the uh, overall preterm birth rate looks very similar to the 32 to 36 week group, because that's where most of the preterm births are occurring. But what it was most important was the top right, which is the 28 to 31 week group. Uh, and you can see we had a significant reduction uh, in that gestational age group. And from a neonatologist, that would be the group that you would be most interested in uh, getting to. 
It's interesting to see the speed at which it happened. So the late preterm births, uh, that, that was an immediate, and that, and that would be immediate because you're altering doctors' behavior primarily to avoid or delay uh, obstetric intervention wherever possible. The 28 to 31 week groups would not come from, from that mechanism. This, this we're sure is coming from cervix length measurement and progesterone. Uh, and that is a delayed effect, of course, that takes a while to become evident. In the 20 to 27 week group, it looks like there's an effect, but the, but the, numbers, the numbers are pretty small, but we think there's an effect there as well. So what happened in our tertiary center? So for the state, our whole state, we've only got, everything's concentrated in one major perinatal center and all early preterm births are all flown down to us. So everything's referred in, we have a very active in utero transfer program. Uh, and, and this is where we're all based, of course, the team's based in this hospital. And we had an immediate 20% reduction and uh, very, very fast. Uh, and we've kept it down since then. So you can see our preterm birth rate in this hospital is about 20% because we're the referral center and we, we dropped it down to 17%. So that's what happened in the major center. So what happened in the years that followed, we've just recently published in PLOS One. And this was a, this was a much more in-depth study. And this was a data linkage study of the three years, 2015 to 2017, compared with the preceding years. And this included all births in WA. And one thing we did was we, retrospectively classified all births as high or low risk at first visit, because it had become evident to us working clinically that in fact, this program wasn't doing a lot different to a woman who's already identified it being high risk, because basically we were doing most of that anyway. We'd, we'd try to delay uh, iatrogenic intervention late in pregnancy is not going to work very much in a very high risk pregnancy because she's going to be delivered on medical grounds, not on social grounds. And we were already measuring cervix length and giving progesterone to women who, who were thought to be at very high risk. So we thought actually, well, actually, we, we didn't think of it at the time, but we thought of it within a year or two that our programs actually designed uh, for women who, who are considered to be at low risk, but actually are at high risk, but we didn't know it. And of course, it's the, the delaying iatrogenic intervention late in pregnancy, that's something that, that is particularly important for women at low risk because they actually didn't have anything wrong with them at all. So I, I hope that little, little paragraph made some sense, but basically this program is, is theoretically going to be most effective uh, in women who you don't realize are at risk. So uh, we retros retrospectively, retrospectively for this paper uh, uh, classified all pregnancies as whether they would have been high or low risk at first visit. So this is what happened overall for all births in the major centre at King Edward. So we lowered it by 20% and we kept it down during that period of time. So the, the educational program and everything we're doing, if, if where we are working, um, uh, continued to work. But in the non-tertiary centres, that's not the case. So we stopped doing the outreach program. We kept the social media program going, but we but we stopped we stopped we stopped the intensity of it in 2016 and 2017, and we saw a deterioration going in the other direction. And this follows this this area follows what was happening simultaneously in the rest of Australia, which which was a progressive increase. So we had an initial effect outside the major hospital and the secondary centres, uh, but then it but then it deteriorated thereafter. And this has told us that the, that an educational program in this regard, which is heavily focused on altering the women's behaviour as well as the healthcare practitioners, has to be continued. And when you think about it, that applies to any educational program, but in particular a pregnancy educational program because the target population is changing every nine months. So in fact, but that's taught us that the intensity of the program has to be absolutely maintained. Uh, this is what happened in the Kimberley. Now that we're very excited about this. So the Kimberley is the Northern part of Western Australia. And the major town there is called Broome. It's a big tourist area. And the, the Kimberley is uh, very important to us because it's got a very high indigenous population. Uh, and we have a lot of patients being sent down. There's 2,000 kilometres away, and they get sent down to Perth, put in hostels around our hospital, 
waiting to go into spontaneous labour. So it's a it's a it's a big investment for us main, maintaining low perinatal mortality rates in the Kimberley. The preterm birth rate there is has, has always been of concern to us, and this this is this this shows um, what's happened in the Kimberley. Now, when we launched this program, we actually deliberately launched it in the Kimberley in Broome. We were making a political statement that this is a very important thing for us that that area. Uh, and the people in Broome, the, 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 the healthcare administrators and the, and the medical staff there were very impressed by us showing the data on progesterone usage from the randomised trials and immediately made progesterone free of charge across the Kimberley. So the Kimberley is the only part of Australia, in fact, only part of any, I know anywhere, where progesterone is actually given free of charge. And that, that was to try to promote its use. And, and as you can see from the slide, these, these are the low risk women. So the high risk women, um, th there was no change and that's because they were all coming down to us anyway. They were identified and coming down to us. But the women who weren't appreciated to be at high risk, we had a dramatic reduction in their preterm birth rate. So this shows that if you put a lot of energy into a particular area, and if you make progesterone free, uh, you, can, you can make quite a big difference. So the thing, the other things in the conclusions from this are that uh, in this paper is that the, the beneficial effects need ongoing attention. The greatest potential benefit of a program like this is women who are not perceived of being at high risk at first booking. But for the Australians listening to this, uh, this is, this is the, the frightening thing. Uh, we've had no effect in the private hospitals. When we did our first analysis, we, we didn't have a data set that would enable us to dissect out private from public, but this, the entire benefit from this program has been in the public sector. So the private institutions, I'm just horrified to say, uh, we've, we've not had an effect in, and uh, this is going to take policy change. So we were, going, we were working hard in that direction uh, of policy change, uh, and had, had, had some big initiatives we were going to introduce, uh, signing off in March of this year, and then COVID hit. So our entire health department's efforts, as you can imagine, were steered in that, that direction. And our, our initiative regarding private care um, uh, were, were put on the back burner. Uh, we hope to get this going next year. We've just got to, just, well, we don't have any COVID basically here in Western Australia, but, but we, the, everything's still just on tender hooks waiting for, for, for a second wave um, and we haven't had one but it's very hard to start such an initiative through the health department right now and then the major benefit in the Kimberley that I've shown. So that's what happened in the West Australian program and then in two years ago we took that story. Oh, I can't hear, sorry. That's Sorry, okay. I've muted. I've muted. Uh, I've muted them. Can oh, okay. Yeah. So that's what happened in Western Australia, and then two years ago, we were very fortunate to be awarded a grant from NHMRC in Canberra, a partnership grant, uh, to basically roll this program out across Australia, and and the basis of it was heavily this. So this these are the preterm birth rates in Australia from 1994 onwards. And as you can see, there's just been a progressive and relentless increase in our nation's preterm birth rate. And this is very similar to other Western countries like ours. It's, it's been a progressive increasing problem. So we formed the Australian Preterm Birth Prevention Alliance with, uh, with uh, a steering committee of about 30 people representing our six states and our two territories and all the various other disciplines that are relevant to the field. And the Alliance has a singular aim, and that is to safely lower the rate of preterm birth in Australia. It, it, it has no other goal. That is its singular goal. And this, this is basically that the people are representing each of the regions uh, and their various, um, and you know, the borders now were, were, were theoretical borders in the past, but are actually functional borders right now, but I'm sure it won't remain as such. And uh, this is a picture of the people. This is a meeting in Sydney back in the days when we could just get on planes and fly around in November 2018 with the executive sitting at the front. And so these are the smiling faces of the people who are going to lead Australia to lower its preterm birth rate. So the objectives are first of all to implement, evaluate and discover. So implementation is implementing known knowledge 
So we now know that implementing uh, knowledge will lower the preterm birth rate somewhere between eight and 20%. The ACT, the Australian Capital Territory, have just released uh, their, their, uh, their findings that in their first year of introducing this program, they lowered their preterm birth rate by 10%. So it looks like with, with no knowledge and a relatively cheap program, you can lower your preterm birth rate between eight and 20%. Then evaluating the effects of that uh, program uh, with, with implementation research, as I've just shown you, uh, but we're setting up the system so we can do it nationally and, for each, and provide each jurisdiction with their own data. I, I actually think these run charts are wonderful and I, I wish I had a run chart for all the conditions I look after. You know, it would be, it would be very nice to know if you, if you had bowel cancer, if you went to your bowel cancer surgeon, they can you show me a run chart of, uh, outcomes from bowel cancer treatment across across this region. It, it would be wonderful to know if you, things are getting better or things are getting worse. Uh, and then discovery, and this is the next platform. We've got, we've got somewhere between 80 and 90% of this problem left, left to find discoveries for. Uh, so this the Alliance provides a perfect platform for uh, people running randomized controlled trials to make them multi-centered and run them out across Australia. And, and the Alliance, Preterm Birth Alliance, works hand in hand with IMPACT, which is our randomized trial subcommittee of, of our perinatal society, and the stillbirth CRE, such that these subcommittees uh, overlap in our meetings that we hold before our national perinatal society meetings each year. So basically, these, these various uh, areas of interest working together should form a wonderful platform for us to be able to rapidly implement multi-centered trials. So one of the first things, this is one of my favorite slides we've ever made. I, I actually love this. This is what happens if you actually look at your data. And you know, it's frightening to think you can work in a field all your career and have no idea what the data look like across your nation, across your states, et cetera. So when we started this, my, my PA who's actually now manager of the Alliance and has a PhD in another area just went to the databases that exist on the net. These are health department reports and graphed out the health department reports no one had done before uh, for each state and territory to see what it looked like. So these are the data for our eight, eight jurisdictions from 1994 up to 2016. So at the top, you can see in brown, that's, that's the Northern Territory. It has a high indigenous population. You'd expect it to have a high preterm birth rate and it most certainly does. New South Wales in blue, so it's always had a relatively low preterm birth rate, which is interesting. Um, and I'm not too sure what it means, but the point of showing you this is the, is the green and that's Tasmania. So if you look on the left-hand side in 1994, Tasmania had the lowest preterm birth rate in Australia, which is really what you'd expect, a very healthy place. It's, a, it's an island, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's synonymous with health and good food and not drinking too much of their beautiful wine. And, and, and that, that's what I think all of us would have expected. But then it progressively rose such that by 2015, 2014, 2015, 2016, it had passed everybody, including the Northern Territory. Tasmania by 2016 had the highest preterm birth rate in Australia. And the fascinating thing is that the Tasmanian Health Department and their clinicians did not know this. So they went from having the lowest preterm birth rate in Australia to the highest in Australia without anybody noticing. And, uh, that, and I, that, that just goes to show the importance of looking at your data. Uh, and so we put a lot of work into Tasmania. We've had two official launches of the Alliance in Tasmania, one in the North and one in the South. We've had all their politicians there and I'm very much hoping that that gets turned around very soon. So that slide, I think, shows the value of just looking at your data. That doesn't cost anything to make. That's just all available online, but no one had put it together before. Okay, so let's just talk in detail about some of these things. And uh, the, the first is this. this the, the, main, the, the bulk of preterm births are, are late preterm births. And so the first intervention of not ending a pregnancy until about 39 weeks gestation takes a lot of work. So, all of you paediatricians, you know the literature. The literature is very clear. One third of brain growth in a fetus occurs between 35 and 39 weeks gestation. Delivering babies early in that time period is associated 
with uh, behavioural and learning problems in childhood. And all the studies, including our own ones here from Western Australia, say exactly the same thing. But how do you get the message out there? We've failed to get the message out into the private sector, but how, how do you get the message out? And so one, one way we've done it is this, and this is basically using data from several sources, but in particular our Western Australian data. And that is we took, we took a hypothetical model. So this is an obstetrician sitting at his or her desk with a woman who's 37 weeks pregnant. And the question on the table is, do you deliver that pregnancy today at 37 weeks? Well, these, are, these are women who don't have any obstetric problem. Do you deliver the pregnancy today at 37 weeks, or are you going to wait two weeks to deliver it at 39 weeks? And this in front of you is the local school, which has 500 children in it. So this is a school eight years later with 500 children in it. And for the model, that obstetrician is delivering all the babies that go to that school and no other obstetrician is going to be feeding into that school. So that's the scenario. I hope you've got that. All right. So it's an obstetrician with this single question. Do I deliver today at 37 or do I wait two weeks? What will that do to the school at, uh, two, at eight years later? Now, of course, the reason for delivering babies early, the medical reason would be to tr try to prevent stillbirth. So how many stillbirths in low risk patients do you need? How many, how many stillbirths will you prevent? in low risk patients by delivering everybody at 37 as opposed to 39 weeks. Well, the number needed to treat in Western Australia in our database is 1300. So if we say 1000 to be generous, we can say that eight years later, there's a one in two chance of there being one extra child in that school. What else would it do? What would be the negative things that it would do? Well, behavioral problems are the most frequent. So each class of 30 children will have two children with an externalizing behavioral disorder. That's a difficult child to look after. What about learning? Across every two classes in, in shown in blue will be one child with need for special educational assistance. And across every three classes, a bit confusing, across every three classes, there'll be two children with a basic numeracy problem. So in other words, if you look at obstetric practice, delivering babies at 37 versus 39 weeks, and then translate that eight years later into the local school, this is what you've got. This is a balance between a one in two chance of having one extra child by preventing a stillbirth versus these children with behavioral and learning problems. So this is how we've started presenting it. And uh, I think it's, I think it's uh, valuable in that when school teachers see this, they suddenly become much more interested uh, in the background of the children in their class. And I'm, and I'm trying to run a little campaign that the school should know uh, the gestational age at birth of the children in classes to give them a better understanding of who they're dealing with. Where that's actually going to go to, I'm not entirely sure, but that's my current, that's my, one of my current projects. Anyway, the Alliance put out a statement uh, um, last year on the importance of this to try to encourage people uh, to de delay childbirth until 39 weeks unless there was a medical reason. Uh, and this was endorsed by our College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. That took a couple of days by the College of Midwives, which was by return email at the speed of an electron, and then by maternity alliances about with equal speed. So this was enthusiastically embraced and it ends with basically that the time to, to, to end a pregnancy should be a partnership between the healthcare provider and the pregnant woman to, to, to balance out, minimize the risk of stillbirth against the risks of harm in childhood. So that's where we're going with that story. Then the measurement of the length of the cervix of all mid-pregnancy scans. Now you guys are pediatricians, so you're probably not that interested in this, but just to show you, this is the, uh, the uh, uh, Roberto Romero analysis, uh, meta-analysis published in February 18, showing the various trials and showing that, that, that vagina progesterone prescribed for short cervix, asymptomatic short cervix in mid-pregnancy to prevent preterm birth less than 33 weeks ha ha is a significant reduction and it's about a 45% reduction. So do you need to do a transvaginal scan on everybody? Well, we think not. And in fact, we couldn't. We couldn't. The pregnancy scans would be about 300,000 a year in Australia. Uh, and we, we can't do a transvaginal scan on everyone. 
And one of our problems is that the transvaginal scan does not carry a separate item number for billing. So there's no financial incentive to do it. So it's, it's, it actually costs a private radiology practice money to add it in. And basically uh, the general consensus is that if on transabdominal imaging, that's on the left with a full bladder, which you can see on the right, if you can see the cervix over its full length, which you usually can, you can see the internal os and the external os. The cutoff is 35 millimeters. And if, the, if it's more than 35 millimeters, that will suffice. The reason the 35 millimeters is this, the cutoff with an empty bladder transvaginally is 25. When you fill the bladder, so you can do a transabdominal scan, it will stretch the cervix and the lower uterus, but it won't stretch at more than 10 millimeters. So the cutoff on transvaginal measurement is 25. The cutoff on transabdominal measurement then is 35. So our protocol is that if you can't see the cervix, or if it's less than 35 millimeters, or if she's got a history of spontaneous preterm birth, she gets a transvaginal scan. And that's what this looks like. So on the left there, that, this is what we're looking for. This is a cervix of 13 millimeters. You can see the two calipers. This woman would be asymptomatic. This is the woman we're hunting for, uh, and she needs to be prescribed vaginal progesterone that day. She needs to start it that night, and then we continue to monitor it. Uh, after that, and we'll stitch the cervix if it continues to shorten. There are a few things I just want to add before I finish. And, and the first is this, we are very keen on midwifery-led continuity of care. Humans like continuity of care. And the data on midwifery-led continuity of care are very compelling. There are 15 trials involving about 17,000 women, heavily out of the UK, and that, that have shown that you can, you, that you, midwifery continuity of care will lower the rate of preterm birth, and it's about 24%. So that means that based on evidence, the single most effective intervention we've got is actually midwifery continuity of care. It actually reduces other obstetric problems as well, including need for analgesia. But there's a cost to midwifery continuity of care. It's an expensive thing. It means that you're introducing each of your new patients to one midwife, she's in a team of say three of them, and she meets all of them, but the one midwife will look after her throughout the pregnancy, will bring her to doctor visits if they are required or when they're required, uh, and uh, she will continue to look after her at home until six weeks after the baby's born, when she'll sign off that breastfeeding's going well and the husband's behaving himself. So midwifery continuity of care is very, very popular. And um, I think something like 17% of Australian births now are managed with midwifery continuity of care. Our challenge is to introduce it across the entire country and across all different models of care, including very high risk cases. But there's, a, there's very much a will to do this. Private obstetricians are a bit threatened by this because, uh, because they don't have data showing that they're that effective. And I've tried arguing with them that the, the difference between private obstetric medicine and midwifery continuity of care is that the midwives have actually studied what they're doing, whereas private medicine has never really subjected themselves to, to rigorous evaluation. It could well be that they've been highly effective in many areas as well, but that's one of the political issues we're dealing with now. So, But we've made a big investment in midwifery continuity of care and put out several statements in that regard. One of the other things is fish oil supplementation, omega-3. And, and this work has been led by a woman called Maria McCready's from Adelaide, who over a period of several decades has done really great work on this. As you know, there was very early promise that, that, that uh, fish oil supplementation in pregnancy would reduce preterm birth. So a lot of data suggesting that was the case. Then there were some conflicting data. Then Australian trial, which stopped the at mega-3 at 35 weeks or so to prevent post-maturity syndrome, which is a complication of this treatment. And, and eventually, to cut a long story short, we were going to recommend this, uh, but, but, but didn't. Uh, and we're holding our fire at the moment because there's some evidence that, in fact, the effectiveness is in women who've got low omega-3 levels early in pregnancy. If they're in the lowest quartile in the early pregnancy, it will work. If they're in the highest quartile in early pregnancy, in other words, women who eat a lot of fish, it may actually be harmful. So we've got a lot of work to do on this before we recommend it. 
But the, the game changer for me is that if you actually got all 300,000 Australian pregnant women each day to eat a, a, a capsule of fish oil, you, it would take a lot of fish. And uh, in fact, we sh the fish don't make omega-3, they get it from seaweed. And so perhaps we should be looking at seaweed and taking a lesson from the Japanese who eat a lot of the right sort of seaweed. Now the seaweed you'd find, Julie, on Bondi Beach or in the background of your of your of your uh, of your presentation today, um, or on our be major beaches here, is largely toxic. So you can't just eat seaweed off an Australian beach. It has to be the right stuff. But we've got we've got a lot of work to do on that. But that's a very promising area. And now I'd just like to finally finish by talking about coronavirus and lockdowns. And I'm sure most of you know this, but this came out in the New York Times and on July the 19th, talking about why, why are there so few premies if we're in, in lockdown areas? And you know, I, I think most of us sort of didn't believe this until it got published. This is published in the uh, Archives of Disease, Diseases of Childhood, Fetal and Neonatal Medicine. And this is the Danish population-based data. And they looked at what happened during their lockdown. They, the doctors didn't really realize what was happening, nor the nurses, but the supply department noticed that their number of the, the supplies going to their neonatal intensive care units had fallen right off. Makes me think, if you want to know how busy people are, don't ask us doctors and nurses, are we busy? Because the answer is, we're always very busy. But if you ask the supply department, you'll find out that we're using consumables. Anyway, they noticed that in the early preterm birth, the very early preterm birth, extremely early preterm births, which is basically up to 28 weeks gestation, as shown on the bottom left here, they had a 91% reduction uh, in preterm births. In fact, their neonatal intensive care units basically emptied. After 28 weeks gestation, there was no change. And there was no change prior to the lockdown. So this is not an effect of COVID. This was, this was potentially an effect of the lockdown. Then Ireland, the Limerick County area around in Ireland, they noticed a 73% reduction in very low birth weight infants. Uh, then somebody sent me the evening news from Calgary in Canada, where there was a pediatrician saying their NICU had emptied out during the lockdown. So what we're doing right now is uh, through the Alliance, uh, trying to get everybody's data and and uh, and Jonathan Morris from Sydney will be in charge of running this, um, basically looking to see what happened in Australia. Australia's got uh, eight jurisdictions and each of those eight jurisdictions has a different story to tell. Some of the jurisdictions had bushfire and drought immediately before COVID and then went into severe lockdown. Uh, Melbourne's just coming out today. And other areas had very little lockdown, like us in the West, because we managed to close our borders. So there are eight different stories in Australia. And we think there's been little to no effect here in Western Australia. But we're getting the data to see exactly what happened. And it could be that there's an amazing story that we're going to learn from lockdown. Could it be that very early preterm birth, which we know has an infectious component, it's horrific to think about it, but could it actually be reduced by the woman being exposed to fewer viruses and bacteria during that period of time? We don't know, but there's, gee, gee whiz, the next year or two as this story gets dissected out, it's going to be very, very interesting. So what are the major issues for us? I haven't mentioned multiple pregnancies. Multiple pregnancies are, 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 are increasing and our, our weapons to deal with preterm birth prevention in multiple pregnancies are much weaker than with singleton pregnancies, we've got a lot of work left to do. Uh, and indigenous pregnancies, we, we also, uh, uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of good ideas. Midwifery group practice can be applied very effectively to indigenous pregnancies with certain adaptations. Uh, and that, that's certainly where we're going. So basically we're now looking for our, our interventions to add to this story, um, um, uh, but at least you know where we're up to by now. So I would, I would like to uh, thank you all very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And um, if any of you are still online, I'd be delighted to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, amazingly inspiring talk. Thank you. We have no effects from the lockdown, I think. Uh, we are still doing well in our unit. 
and I thought I would have a good business case for the seaweed, but obviously not. Um, okay, Srini Bolisetti from the Royal has asked a question. Um, can you see it on the chat pane? No. Okay, he says, um, increased birth rate turns in Tasmania. Can this be due to better reporting? Um, uh, would it be nice to supplement the information with preterm admissions, which may be more accurate? Um, so I'm sorry. I've just I've just managed to get my slides off. I'm sorry. Could you could you repeat? Is it okay, is it due Shrini, to reporting in Tasmania? All right, Shrini, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question yourself? Can he unmute himself? He's basically yeah, asking sorry. whether the increased rates of preterm birth in Tasmania may be due to better reporting. Uh, no, I don't think so. No, I, I, I doubt it very much. I think Australia's perinatal data collections in each of the jurisdictions is, is pretty intact. I, 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 I doubt that's the case. They don't think that's the case. Um, no, I think it's. I think it's a. I think it was a real effect. Okay, uh, Kurt um, just says, fantastic talk, continue your work. And Prof Boo from Malaysia says, what are your strategies to sustain your preterm birth prevention program in WA? Well, I'm very lucky that I'm so young and that I, I have plenty of, uh, plenty of decades of work ahead of me. So I'm not that young. Uh, so, uh, but basically we, the strategies are that if you look at the membership of the Alliance uh, Steering Committee, We've, we've been very careful to make sure that we've got great succession planning. So we've got in each of the states and territories, we typically have a very senior person and a very junior person on their way up. So we uh, will hopefully sustain this with, a, with all age groups covered. Um, we are act actively out um, uh, fundraising in this area to make sure that we have plenty of resources in there. But I, I, think, I think it's fair to say that you know, 10 years ago, preterm birth prevention was not a topic of great conversation in, in my world, in the perinatal world, uh, but it is very much now. So I think the enormity of the problem, the, the, the fact that we now know you can reduce your preterm birth rate by, an amount, by a certain amount uh, will propel it into the future. I think this will thrive and prosper well beyond my time. Okay, um, there's a couple of com comments before we go on to Professor Sam from Singapore. Janelle Young says that increased birth rates may be due to changing socioeconomic status due to large job losses. Yeah, well, yep. what, what, what's going to happen with, with job losses and the effects of COVID? Uh, does lockdown reduce preterm birth? Does it cause preterm birth? What's our fertility rate done during this period of time? Has it gone down because of economic reasons or has it gone up because people got sick, sick of watching Netflix all day? Uh, I, we don't know the answer to any of those questions right now. I don't think this is just socioeconomic. And in fact, if you look in Australia, uh, in many ways, it's the opposite. So we know that the preterm birth rate in the private sector has been increasing. So the old idea that we all grew up with as young students was that a lot of these conditions of just due to poor socioeconomic conditions, the story is not that simple. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, preterm birth does not respect postcodes or your bank account. It can affect anybody. And uh, our biggest challenge is in the private sector. So I don't think this is just socioeconomic. But what's, hap what's going to happen as a result of the incredible complexities that have been introduced due to the pandemic is is really yet to be that story is yet to be told. Okay, and Adrian wants you to consider pregnancy loss and stillbirth. Of course, um, could I um, ask Professor Sam to ask his question? Oh, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, uh -huh. uh, John, excellent talk. I'm Sam from Singapore. I have two comments. You know, one is the what is the effect of the misuse or overuse of corticosteroids during pregnancy for late preterm? Some of them use it you know, up to 38 weeks for elective section. They say they follow the nice guidelines. And you know, what is the effect as far as the neurodevelopment is concerned? Well, um, 
I don't know if, if you know, but um, we, we've studied this in Perth and have published on the effects of repeated steroids. Um, we've been publishing that for, for 20 years, uh, showing that in our sheep model, that, that antidotal corticosteroids stop, uh, just shut down the oligodendrocytes that make myelin. And if you give repeated courses, the myelin, myelination and brain growth have not recovered even by adulthood. So we have been always very cautious with, with overuse of antenatal corticosteroids. We, are in, my, in the world I live in here in Western Australia, we, we don't use it after 34, 35 weeks. Um, we're very impressed by the British data, which uh, suggests that if you use it after that period of time, you may prevent a night on oxygen for the newborn, but you significantly increase the chance of the child spending the rest of their life in the lowest quartile of academic performance. And that to me is not a sensible trade-off. Now, not everybody's in agreement with that. Uh, there's a trial beginning out of Auckland, which William Tano Mordi, who's on this, I'm sure know far more about than I do. And Martin Cluckow, who I could just see is on, the, on this line as well. Um, uh, which, which is using it uh, for, before elective cesarean section up to 39 weeks gestation. So uh, that's something I'm not, not too keen on. Um, so I, I'm very worried. I, I mean, I, I, I know the sheep data very well. I've seen the electron micrographs and what, what it does to myelination. And I personally, I personally would never personally prescribe We're, we've got, we're, we're, we're working on making antenatal corticosteroids safer. No one's ever done a dose response curve in humans. We've done 30 randomized trials. No one's done a dose response curve. And we, uh, we're, we've got a lot of work going on that to, to make it safer. Yeah. William, you've got a question. Um, he wants you to link the CP Alliance registries. I just wanted to, uh, are you planning to um, do data linkage with the cerebral palsy registries in Australia to confirm that there's going to be an associated fall in CP along with the demonstration of reduction in preterm birth? Well, thank you. In the future, we will. In fact, Nadi Badawi, who runs the, the as you know, runs the uh, CP story out of Sydney, has been very keen to meet them and we haven't had our meeting because of COVID, but that's what we're going to do. The CP rates in Australia are falling, aren't they? They've fallen from one in 500 births to I think one in 700 births. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's, that's not due to what we've been doing. I think that's due to a whole, whole bunch of things like prenatal diagnosis perhaps, but uh, yes, of course we will, but that's, that's, that's a bit more aspirational to be quite blunt, but yes, thank you. So William, I've got a linkage that's been just approved to look at all New South Wales births from 2001 to 2018. And it's linked to the CP Alliance registry as well. So we could look at that if you're interested. Um, that wasn't my aim, but um, yes. <laughs> okay, and there was just a comment from Maria Boyle to say that the cost of midwifery-led care is small in comparison to the major benefits, particularly used in collaborative care. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, and that's the, that's the argument we've been running and uh, effectively uh, here, here in my environment, but it, it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to sell to administrators. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they're interested in their budget today, not benefits for tomorrow. But uh, I do give credit to the people around me. In fact, we're just about to start our first Indigenous uh, midwifery continuity of care program here. And uh, that's been... That's been um, that's been based on the fact that this uh, not only is the right thing to do, but will also should save money. Yeah. So maybe a final comment from Dr. Rina Wati in Indonesia, where she's found an increasing number of preterm births because of preeclampsia. Far way to go um, to decrease preterm births for us, but your talk has given her motivation. Thank you. So maybe when COVID um, lifts up, you can hop across the ditch to uh, Indonesia, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yes, I, I, I sincerely hope so. Even uh, Bali's out of bounds now. Oh, Bali. Yeah. Oh, don't remind me. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, we're right out, we're run out of time. Your talk is inspirational, John. Thank you so much. And it's amazing work. You're just like everywhere. Um, social media, schools, hospitals, everything. 
Yeah. So Thanks. if anyone has any more questions, um, they can email John.